The Night Beat starts right now. Tonight, hundreds more cases of COVID-19 confirmed here in Bear County as we head into Father's Day. The city hoping that holiday won't be reason for even more cases. Tonight, Bear County has crossed the 6,000 case threshold with nearly another 400 more cases since just yesterday. That brings our total now to 6,344. But on a lighter note, no new deaths to report. That number remaining at 96 tonight. And while more than 2,500 people have recovered, there are still 336 COVID-19 patients in local hospitals tonight. Now we have more coronavirus coverage coming up in a bit, but first. No mother or father should have to ever bury their child. And for their child to be taken in the way he was taken, it's not right. The family of a local up and coming boxer frustrated after their loved one, George Ramos, was shot and killed at the young age of 18 years old last year. Tonight we hear from his mother for the first time since the tragic shooting. Her mission is to find the one responsible for taking her son's life. Like we still cry every night. Um, we go to the gym and it's hard for us and the kids say we feel him here like we feel him here. Exactly one year later, Jessica Ramos is still hurting. San Antonio police say her son, 18-year-old professional boxer George Ramos, was gunned down while he sat in his truck at Les Harrison in Calabria Road. Ramos says she relives that day over and over again. And he was going to meet me at 4 o'clock to go enlist in the Army. And he was going to meet me at 4, but at 1 o'clock is when they shot my son. Today, George's family held a fundraiser to help increase the Crime Stoppers' reward to find his killer. And hopefully somebody turns him in because it wasn't right. He took our whole world from us. I used to say Georgie was like my Superman. My other kids would call him, you know, Thor and uh, Captain America. So he was like our superhero. A superhero with a big heart robbed, his family says, of a promising boxing career. He only made it to two fights. He was 2-0. and oh. He won both fights. His mother says as the owner of his own boxing gym, George had his entire life planned. The army, a wife, and children. At 40, he was going to take over our company, do 20 years in the military, and, you know, he took away my five grandkids. He took away, you know, me. I was so excited to have a daughter-in-law. Now she says she will stop at nothing to see justice is served for her son. I pray to God to forgive me because I will not forgive that person who did that to my son. If you have any information that could lead to an arrest in George Ramos's murder, you're urged to call Crime Stoppers. That number is 210-224-STOP. Other top stories we're following this Saturday night. Our crews counting dozens of shell casings following a shooting on the east side this evening that left a man in critical condition. It all happened outside of a restaurant on Lakewood Drive and South WW White Road. Police tell us the victim and another person were in a white vehicle when what's been described as a dark colored vehicle pulled out in front of them. Witnesses telling police four men got out and fired several shots, striking the victim multiple times before fleeing. Police did take a man into custody at the scene who they say would not cooperate with them. That man's involvement right now unclear tonight. No one else was injured, though the restaurant and several cars did receive damage from the gunfire. Two people rushed to the hospital, one victim facing life-threatening injuries after a T-bone crash on the city's north side. This happened near Blanco and Calico Landing before five this evening. Police say one driver was making a turn when the other driver slammed into them. One person from each vehicle was injured. A family left to deal with the aftermath of an early morning fire on the city's east side. Firefighters called to a home on Caton Avenue, not far from Rigsby and South Walter Street. Alicia Barrera spoke to firefighters at the scene. Good afternoon. Well, arson is taking over this investigation and they have a lot to comb through as the damage is extensive. Most of the damage can see can be seen towards the front of the home and even through the roof. Fire Captain Brandon Schultz said that the flames had fully taken over the porch of this white home by 630 this morning. Crews were able to quickly control and knock down those flames. And as of now, the scene is clear and no hot spots have popped up. No injuries were reported and right now there isn't a suspicion suspected cause that was mentioned by fire crews at the scene, but they estimate the damages to be at about $50,000. Firefighters say they're thankful that no one was inside the home during this fire, but that family is now displaced. Reporting in the city's east side, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. 
A COVID-19 test coming back positive for an employee at the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. The center says it is keeping donors informed, even though they say there is limited close contact between donors and staff. The employee reportedly developed symptoms after working at a donor room on the Village Drive last weekend and another donor room on Culebra Road on Monday. The actual transmission to the employee was believed to have occurred outside of work through a close family member. In a statement, the center says, quote, although the risks of transmission of the virus is low because of the use of face masks and gloves and other precautions, we have asked the team members who worked with the employee to be tested, end quote. A growing number of people are going in for COVID-19 testing amid this recent spike of cases. The surge quickly filling up the appointment slots at uh, the Freeman Coliseum testing site through Tuesday. The registration system will reopen again on Monday for those who would like to make appointments for later in the week. Meanwhile, a walk-up testing site will open in Adkins tomorrow. The site will be at the Emergency Services District Number 12, Station 136. That's located in the 11,800 block of Highway 87 East. Testing will take place there from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Then on Monday, a walk-up testing site will be up at Jordan Middle School and run through Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Walk-up testing sites are expected to expand now to six days a week. And you can find more testing locations, health resources, and all the latest stories related to the coronavirus pandemic at our website at ksat.com. Just click on the coronavirus tab on our homepage. It was the president's first campaign rally since the pandemic began tonight. Despite rising COVID-19 case numbers, cheering crowds gathered inside the Bank of Oklahoma Center in Tulsa to hear him and the vice president speak. But outside a much different scene, Vincent Crivelli with our sister station KPRC in Houston was there and brings us all of the sights and the sounds. We're having fun in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As President Donald Trump's rally kicked off inside the BOK Center, there was celebrating in the street. I mean, this is the first Trump rally after, you know, coronavirus. However, there was also protesting. We don't agree with Trump being here because we think he divides the country. Minutes later, things heated up. Because you're a bunch of slaves yourselves. You're slaves to Satan. Dozens of protesters also marched through the street. <laughs> Many holding signs and chanting, making their voices heard. You know, we've got moments where we're being really civil and good and other moments where we're just yelling and screaming. There were several yelling matches. However, no apparent winners. That's something everyone agreed on. Do you think the messages are getting across? Uh, no, I don't think yelling. If people aren't interested in hearing what other people have to say. It's just the way things are now. Do you think your message is getting across? No, no. They're too dug in. Americans disagreeing with each other, getting loud, but also remaining peaceful, at least for now. That was Vincent Crivelli reporting. Coming up at 1030, we'll head inside of the arena to hear what the president had to say. More now on the race for the White House with the Democratic Party's nomination for president all but official. Former Vice President Joe Biden is making moves to set up his transition team. Former Senator Ted Kaufman is heading Biden's crew. Kaufman also aided in his transition as vice president back in 2008. According to a Biden campaign aide, the announcement of the transition team falls in line with when past candidates develop their own teams. Other team members are expected to join in the coming weeks. Fundraising for President Trump's election campaign has been rebounding. The re-election campaign and RNC brought in $74 million in May. That's an improvement over April, but it's less than the nearly $81 million presumptive Democratic candidate Joe Biden and the DNC report raising the same month. As for cash on hand, the RNC and Trump campaign boasted $265 million at the end of May. The DNC had about $100 million at the end of April. Biden's campaign isn't revealing that information for May. Outside with live cam, 84 degrees at the airport under mostly clear skies. Plenty of humidity out there this evening as well. It was a hot and humid Saturday and not a whole lot is going to change as we head into the day tomorrow for Father's Day. Our high temperature this afternoon made it up to 93 and really that's not too much hotter than where our average high temperature is this time of year. That number is 93 degrees. Uh, elsewhere across South Texas, very similar numbers. 97 the high temperature in New Braunfels, low 90s up in the hill country and 100 100 degrees. You did it, Katua. That was your high temperature this afternoon. So very similar numbers tomorrow, but also a small chance at a shower. We'll talk about that and I'll have a look at your full forecast coming up in just a bit. Daphne. 
Still ahead on the night beat, a federal judge rules former National Security Advisor John Bolton can move forward push publishing his tell-all book despite efforts from the Trump campaign or Trump administration to block the release. That story is next. A ruling today in the case of the United States versus John Bolton. The judge not stopping publication of Bolton's new book, but saying his conduct in releasing that book, quote, raises grave national security concerns. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert with the details. D.C. District Judge Royce Lamberth ruling on Saturday that former National Security Advisor John Bolton may move forward with publishing his political memoir, The Room Where It Happened, but saying in taking it upon himself to publish his book without securing final approval from national intelligence authorities, Bolton may indeed have caused the country irreparable harm. In a statement to ABC News, Bolton's attorney says, we welcome today's decision, but added they take issue with the preliminary conclusion that Bolton did not comply with his contractual pre-publication obligation to the government. Even though the judge failed to halt the book's release, President Trump taking to Twitter Saturday morning, calling today's ruling a big court win, writing, strong and powerful statements and rulings on money and on breaking classification were made. The president spoke to reporters as he left the White House on his way to his campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I think the judge was very smart and very indignant at what Bolton did. I think it was a great ruling. Judge Lamberth strongly indicates Bolton's hopes of keeping profits from the book are endangered, and he could face criminal prosecution for disclosing classified information. ABC's Martha Raddus sat down with Bolton early this week for an exclusive interview. You described the president as erratic, foolish, behaved irrationally, bizarrely. You can't leave him alone for a minute. He saw conspiracies behind rocks and was stunningly uninformed. He couldn't tell the difference between his personal interests and the country's interests. I don't think he's fit for office. I, I don't think he has the competence to carry out the job. There really isn't any guiding principle uh, that I was able to discern other than uh, what's good for Donald Trump's re-election. Now, Bolton still faces a civil case brought on by the federal government over his alleged breach of his non-disclosure agreement. Andrew Dimber, ABC News, Washington. And a quick programming note, Ma Martha Raddatz's full interview with John Bolton airs tomorrow night at 9 right here on KSAT 12. Uh, taking a look at weather, of course, it was decent today, but I'm pretty sure tomorrow, thankfully, my dad has no hair, so <laughs> humidity is not going to be a problem for them. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's a good way. Might so. need a towel to... <laughs> yes, yeah. he's off, right? as shiny as possible, well, but he's beautiful. He's sunscreen, right? Sunscreen? Yeah. Yes, sunscreen. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that I, I'm sure that can be problematic. Yeah, <laughs> seen some pictures and video before. Yeah, uh, hope all the dads are ready for a great Father's Day tomorrow. The weather's not going to change much from where it was today, but something happened precisely at 443 this afternoon. Summer began and this is just a quick look at what the summer solstice is. But before we talk about the solstice, uh, we've got to talk about where our seasons come from and it all has to do with the tilt of the earth. The earth is tilted 23.5 degrees and it is this tilt that helps to give us our different seasons and the different seasons are determined by which hemisphere is closest to the sun. So Northern Hemisphere, where we live as we get into summer, yes, you guessed it. This is when our Northern Hemisphere is tilted closest to the sun. This gives us our hottest months of the year, typically shortest days and longest uh, nights there in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and it's going to be feeling a lot like summer as we get into the day tomorrow. A little quick look at your poolside forecast here as you're celebrating dad up to 90 by lunchtime. We'll be in the mid 90s by about 3 p.m. We're going for a high temperature right around 96 tomorrow afternoon, and you'll notice a 20% chance of a shower at lunchtime. But then as we get in later into the afternoon, that chance just drops to about a 10% chance of a stray shower. I'm expecting most of us uh, to get through Father's Day without any rain. We'll switch over to our Max computer here. Here we go. I think the biggest thing you'll notice tomorrow for Father's Day, the heat and the humidity. So these are not your forecast high air temperatures, but these are where we're thinking the heat index could max out tomorrow afternoon. So remember the heat index is what it feels like to us when you factor in the humidity. So forecasting a high of around 96 in San Antonio, but it could feel as hot as 100, maybe 101 briefly tomorrow afternoon. But I actually think these numbers down near the coast are a little underdone. I think your heat index coastal Bend counties could be 
closer to 105 plus tomorrow afternoon. So bottom line, a hot and humid Father's Day. Here's a look at our air temperatures right now. We're at 84 in San Antonio, still at 91 at this hour out in Del Rio. Low 80s up in the hill country, so it's still very warm out there. And the cherry on top, it's also very humid. Check out our dew point numbers in the 70s for most of us, pushing 80 in Beeville. That's about as bad as it gets there. So we are maxed out here on our humidity scale. It is oppressively muggy out there, and unfortunately, that will not be changing in the short term here. As far as radar is concerned, rain kind of was to our west and to our east today. There were more downpours near the Houston area this afternoon. Those have all come to an end, and there was some thunderstorm activity in the higher terrain of northern Mexico and far west Texas. That is also starting to wind down and should stay well west of the border for the next couple of hours. So overnight, really what we'll be looking at is just the return of that lower cloud cover. It'll build back in through tomorrow morning, and I do think we could have a couple of early morning showers, so that's why your best chance to maybe see a little bit of rain will actually be during the first part of the day tomorrow. Tomorrow morning through about lunchtime. We get into the afternoon. I think there will still be some showers there east of 35, just like there were today. But for most of us, rain will evade us as we get into Father's Day. And even early next week, Monday into Tuesday, our rain chance is just going to stay at about 20%. And here's why. It's our overall setup. We've got the heat high well to the west. That's good news because it's not oppressively hot. And it's also far enough away that we can get some of those pop up showers um, in the morning and afternoon hours that allows that for our, our atmosphere to pop those showers and storms up. I actually think we'll start to see rain chances trend upward a bit middle of the week Wednesday into Thursday as a little upper level low tries to develop down near the coast. That'll help us out. You see the rain chances there increase 30 to 40 percent. That's not great. We're hopeful maybe we can bump them up a little bit more uh, Thursday of next week. In the meantime, really low in rain chances here as we get into your Father's Day 77 in the morning, 96 in the afternoon, a hot and humid day for dad and the Saharan dust still on track to arrive on Tuesday. We're going to talk much more about that coming up next half hour, and I'll kind of let you know uh, when you can maybe start to feel the effects of that coming up. Well, I guess Guys. tomorrow's a, a good day to take Dad to the pool, huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, Katie. Every time they take me to the pool, they just make me clean it. Since it's <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Andrew, NBA is ramping up its uh, process to getting back to playing some sports. That's right. The next step right now is bringing coaches back. It's been limited for the past couple weeks, but now we're hearing reports that it could be as much as 10 coaches at practice moving forward. When we come back, more details on how practices are becoming more uh, jam-packed as we get prepared for the return of the season. Plus, no vote on the MLB season yet. Next. The NBA will now allow as many as 10 coaches inside team facilities beginning this Tuesday while the league ramps up toward their return to play at the end of July. ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski broke the news this afternoon via Twitter. This mirrors the players' gradual return to action as well. The 22 teams who are still alive this season will next be allowed to have four players at facilities starting Tuesday. That number will increase to eight from July 1st to the 9th, after which, port, after which point excuse me, teams will need to report to Walt Disney World in Florida for the latter half of this season. More NBA news this afternoon. Dates have now been set for the start of the draft and free agency. This year's NBA draft will take place on October 16th and teams will be allowed to talk to free agents two days later on the 18th. After that, a league-wide moratorium on communications will be in effect until the 23rd. If the season restarts as planned, this is setting up to be a pretty crazy October. If there is a Game 7 of the NBA Finals this year, it most likely be on October 13th, which is now just three days before the draft. If the Spurs can't make up any ground on the rest of the playoff field, they could be in line for their first top 15 pick since 1997. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. A couple of weeks ago, the Cowboys released a video featuring players like Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott, among others, to showcase their current stance on racial injustice. But the one man conspicuously absent from that video was Cowboys owner Jerry Jones. He's also since remained silent as the NFL has made Juneteenth a permanent holiday. Newly acquired defensive lineman Gerald McCoy says Jones's ongoing silence speaks volumes. It don't look good. I'll say that. It, just, it doesn't look good. And... You can't you can't be silent at a time like this. You know, I'm I'm new to the Cowboys organization and I'm I'm blessed to be part of this organization, but when things are not going well for the team, you know, you you can hear him screaming. Um, well, this is life. This is bigger than just football, it's bigger than money, it's bigger than uh winning a Super Bowl and something something needs to be said. And I'm not here here's how I feel because of the, his level of who he is and how many people listen to him. That's why I'm saying it. Everybody doesn't have to speak up. I'm not saying everybody has to say anything. If you want to be silent, that's fine. 
But the level of who he is, yeah, I think something needs to be said. Meanwhile, Major League Baseball is no closer to terms, uh, coming to terms on starting the 2020 season. Via ESPN, the executive board met Saturday, but players will not vote on the league's latest proposal until new data is available regarding testing for the coronavirus. This comes after news broke that all MLB training camps have temporarily closed due to a multitude of positive tests across the league on Friday, including five Phillies. A vote on the latest 60-game proposal was possible on Sunday, but after today's events, that vote has likely been delayed. The NHL is going through similar issues right now. The Tampa Bay Lightning recently closed their team's facilities after three players and additional staff members tested positive for the virus. All told, 11 of the 200 NHL players tested after training facilities were reopened on June 8th have tested positive. The NHL is still targeting July 10th as a start date for training camps, but with coronavirus cases spiking in the U.S., the league is now looking at Canada as a potential hub for the upcoming 2014 playoff format. And now golf has their own coronavirus process put to the test. Nick Watney became the first player on the PGA Tour to test positive for COVID-19 and withdrew prior to the start of the second round of the RBC, T, uh, excuse me, RBC Heritage Tournament on Friday. Rory McIlroy was close to Watney on Friday morning, and here's what he had to say. We had a chat on the putting green <laughs> before this I morning. went out to play. Yeah, but we were we were at a distance, so he, he was just saying, look, I hope I didn't get too close to you, or, you know, you know, I, I, you know he feels badly that he was, that he was, that he was here um, today at the golf course, and I said, look, it's fine, I... You know, you, you never know. So, you know, I said to him, if I was in your position, I probably would have been here too. And look, it's, you know, at this point, you just have to concentrate on, on getting better and getting healthy. And coming up later in the show, we head back to the racetrack, this time for some horse racing and plenty of history. Won't want to miss who won the Belmont Stakes. Guys? Thank you, Andrew. Stay with us. President Trump defying the warning of health experts holding his first campaign rally in more than 100 days tonight in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And while many of his supporters had been lining up for days to get inside, crowds were a bit smaller than expected. Here's ABC's Karina Mitchell with the details. We're having fun in Tulsa, Oklahoma. As President Donald Trump's rally kicked off inside the BOK Center, there was celebrating in the street. I mean, this is the first Trump rally after, you know, coronavirus. However, there was also protesting. We don't agree with Trump being here because we think he divides the country. Minutes later. The FBI is now investigating the death of Breonna Taylor, a Kentucky EMT who was killed after police officers forced their way inside her home. Taylor was shot eight times in March after police entered her apartment to serve a search warrant for drugs. Her family says officers did not knock or announce themselves. According to police, Taylor's boyfriend opened fire when he heard someone enter the home. Officers then returned fire, killing Taylor. None of the plainclothes officers wore body cameras on the night of the shooting, but officers say they did announce themselves. Police later said they found no drugs and the suspect they were looking for had been arrested hours before they entered Taylor's apartment. Police have identified the woman accused of starting the fire at the Wendy's where Rayshard Brooks was killed by police in Atlanta. Investigators believe that she might have had a romantic relationship with Brooks. Atlanta Fire and Rescue tweeted an arrest warrant for Natalie White. She is now facing a first degree arson charge. Investigators say evidence shows White starting the fire at Wendy's last week. In police body cam video from the night Brooks was killed, Brooks identifies White as his girlfriend. Officials also believe more Suspects might be involved with setting the fire. A protest near an Atlanta police precinct got physical this morning. This video of a police officer shoving a protester was recorded just after midnight. Police say metal barricades being used to protect the Atlanta police zone three precinct were moved by protesters. People were seen moving those metal barricades closer to officers. Atlanta police say they gave three warnings for those protesters to move back. One officer could be seen walking around the side of the barricade, grabbing one of the protesters and forcefully throwing that person to the ground. That person was not seriously injured. APD has not yet commented. Another Confederate statue has been brought down, this time in Washington, D.C. This was the scene last night as dozens of protesters pulled the statue of Confederate Army General Albert Pike off its pedestal into the ground. Moments later, it was set on fire. The memorial in the Judiciary Square neighborhood of D.C. was the only Confederate statue in the district. The protest caught the attention of President Trump, who tweeted the D.C. police were not doing their job and called for the arrests of the demonstrators. 
The National Institute of Health is stopping its trial of the drug hydroxychloroquine, saying it is not beneficial to the coronavirus patients. The trial involved more than 470 adult patients. It found that people who were randomly given hydroxychloroquine treatment didn't benefit from the drug. The drug, which is used to treat malaria, was touted by President Donald Trump, who said he used it himself. Earlier this week, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration revoked emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine to treat hospitalized patients. All right, we had a little trouble with the video the first time because it was the wrong one, but let's try this story again. President Trump defining the warning of health, his health experts holding his first rally in more than 100 days tonight in Oklahoma. And while many of his supporters were lining up for days, the crowds were a little bit thinner than expected. Here's ABC's Karina Mitchell with the details. President Trump pressed ahead with a rally in Tulsa even after six members of his advance team, including two Secret Service agents, tested positive for COVID-19. Also, the number of confirmed cases hit new highs in Tulsa, something the president was quick to downplay. When you, test a, when you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. But what was meant to be a defiant comeback was met with empty seats and a less than enthusiastic reception. However, outside the BOK Center, protesters brought a message of unity. Racial strife, deeply rooted in Oklahoma, going back to the 1921 Tulsa race massacre where white mobs attacked the Greenwood neighborhood, one of the wealthiest black areas in the country, known as Black Wall Street. They murdered residents and destroyed their businesses. Unequivocally, the president is not welcome in Greenwood. But others camped out for days to get a seat at what the president promised would be an unforgettable night before departing the White House. But just hours before the event was to begin, the Trump campaign announced it was canceling its outdoor speech by the president. President Trump blaming radical protesters for the lower turnout. You're putting cuffs on me. The swaths of empty seats caused the campaign to scrap plans for the president to address an overflow space outside the stadium. The warm-up act coming in the form of the vice president. People are going back to work and worship. We're getting back out to stores and restaurants and the great outdoors. The transition to greatness has begun. The city had planned a curfew to keep the peace, but the White House pressured against it. The National Guard on standby as crowds disperse, potentially interacting with police and protesters. Karina Mitchell, ABC News, New York. As COVID-19 continues to affect more families, it's time to figure out how you would handle laundry if someone in your home tested positive. 12 in your size, Marilyn Moritz has some simple but important steps to keep you healthy. If you're living with someone infected with COVID-19, something as routine as laundry deserves extra care. First, Consumer Report says keep any contaminated laundry in a separate bin. We don't know exactly how long this coronavirus survives on fabrics or clothes, but researchers think that it's possible the virus can remain infectious on clothes for hours or even days. So for any clothes that may have been exposed to the virus, consider those contaminated and keep those in a separate laundry bin. If you have disposable gloves, use them. If you don't have gloves, you can absolutely do the laundry with your bare hands. And just be sure to wash your hands thoroughly afterward, whether or not you have gloves. You can wash the laundry of a COVID-19 patient as you normally would. Experts say no special detergent or bleach is needed, but use the warmest appropriate water temperature and dry completely. Remember to disinfect surfaces that may have been contaminated like the doorknobs and pulls. And if you're using a shared laundry facility, disinfect surfaces before you touch them. And most important, your chances of getting the virus from someone else directly are much higher than getting the virus from a surface. So the most important thing is to stay at least six feet away from anyone else. And when you're done, wash your hands. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Outside with live cam, still sitting at 84 degrees. Looks like we've got a few little clouds there in the sky, but for the most part, the skies are mostly clear, and it's been just mainly a hot and humid day across South Texas. I want to give you a quick look at what's going on in the tropics. Things are pretty quiet out there. There is one disturbance, and you've got to kind of zoom in a bit here to see it. It's centered just off to the west of Bermuda. This only has a 10% chance of any development in the next two to five days, so not a big deal here, and it's very quiet elsewhere in the Atlantic. 
Big reason for that, Saharan dust. It is still set to arrive early next week. We're going to take a closer look at that coming up next. Mother's Day, we get mom's flowers. Father's <laughs> Day, we make dad still grill. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. That's but be true. sure to buy dad like some type of, you know, watch or something really nice. A tie, you know. Didn't we? Yeah, we went through that, like what dads actually want, and it's not ties. Yeah, not <laughs> definitely not ties. I'll take tie dyes. Yeah, like, no, my dad. Tie dye he, shirts, those are cool. My yeah. dad would take like some fried fish, mm? oh. fish fry. I'd do a fish fry. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Uh, I'm glad we're going to get through tomorrow without any issues from the Saharan dust. It is expected to move in Tuesday of next week. And this is something I kind of came up with this evening. The Saharan dust outlook, not really a formal forecast, but we again expect this dust to begin to move in on Tuesday. Now, as far as how dense it's going to be. It should be a bit more moderate when it moves in on Tuesday, so it will be noticeable. It will kind of make it go, mm, it'll make the skyline look a little bit different. Wednesday, it should actually thin out a bit, so not so bad, but Thursday, it's not good. Bigger, denser plume of that dust is expected to move in on Thursday, and then it could hang around through next weekend, so this is, this is not great. I mean, look at this plume of dust out in the Atlantic moving into the Caribbean this evening, uh, and so the scale here that I have for you, this kind of allows you to see, we see the darker brown, that is the more dense dust, those lighter shades, it goes moderate there, and then light where you kind of see that lightest tan color, and you'll notice as we get into Tuesday, this first little plume comes in, and it's going to be more light to moderate as we get into Tuesday. Then Wednesday, a little bit of a break. Certainly some of it's still hanging around in the air, but it's Wednesday and then into Thursday that that dark brown color starts to settle in. And this is not only going to be an issue for us here in South Texas, uh, but also up into North Texas, the Central Plains, and often to some of the other uh, Gulf Coast states as well. So this will be something that not only we deal with here in South Texas, but that some, uh, some other spots across the country will be dealing with as we get into next week. For now, things are nice out there. We did get to see some blue sky today. And with live cam, we've got a few clouds there, but otherwise, uh, mostly clear skies for now. I do think our sensor is picking up on some high thin clouds out there. Uh, that's why we're reading mostly cloudy 84 dew point in the low 70s because of that south southeast wind. But at least there's been a pleasant breeze through the evening hours. That'll be the case tomorrow as well. Still nice and warm off to the southwest. Still 86 in Catula, 91 in Del Rio. Overnight we'll see again skies become mostly cloudy and temperatures fall generally into the mid to upper 70s. So it will be another warm night. We'll start you off around 77 degrees here in San Antonio under mostly cloudy skies up to 96 tomorrow afternoon. Some triple digits possible down to the south and to the west. Not quite as hot temperature down on the coastal bend, but your humidity will be just a smidge higher, and that's going to put your heat index values down to the southeast tomorrow. Well above 105 degrees. We could be 105 to 110 as we get into the heat of the day tomorrow. Partly cloudy skies. Better chance of a little shower down on the coastal bend uh, as we get into tomorrow afternoon as well. Here in town, just a 20% chance of a shower. Actually, your best chance of rain will be earlier in the day. Some early morning showers and sprinkles, but by the afternoon, just a 10% chance. So a good pool day tomorrow to celebrate Dad. Yeah, go ahead and find him a cool spot uh, to enjoy, enjoy Father's Day tomorrow. Again, I mentioned the breeze that we have out there this evening. Evening. It'll be in place again tomorrow, so even as we get up to 96 tomorrow afternoon, feeling more like 100, we'll have this nice breeze to kind of keep that air moving around, and uh, that helps us out. We'll take it, that's for sure. One last look at future cast here. It is not showing anything too impressive in the rainfall department. Again, a few sprinkles early in the morning. In the afternoon, a few more showers, mainly well east of the I-35 corridor, so a lot of us tomorrow will get through your Sunday without any rain. Not necessarily a good thing. We could use it, but with a... Pretty quiet weather pattern in place. We'll keep low in chances of rain in the forecast through the middle of next week. It does look like rain chances increase slightly by Thursday, but with that dust hanging around, it will be interesting to see if we get some of that muddy rain across parts of South Texas. Yeah, Katie, next. I think we can. you can apply that red sad face you have for the dust to the heat and humidity <laughs> tomorrow as well, but it'll be a frown turned upside down because Dad will be happy on yes. Father's Day. Yeah. yeah, but if we get muddy raindrops on our clean cars, we'll be happy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
All right, in sports, Andrew, uh, UTSA, like many programs, football, having to deal with all sorts of issues besides football right now. That's absolutely right. Then they've had to deal with a lot in football related, too. They have a new coach, new system, obviously less practice with COVID-19 recently, limiting practice and all, uh, all the regulations involved with that. But they've also dealt with racial injustice. We come back, how the team is handling racial adversity, or excuse me, adversity throughout the offseason, plus history in New York at the Belmont Stakes. Next. Texas A&M football is hoping that this will be their breakout season in the SEC. That's, of course, if there is a season. Since the NCAA has allowed college teams to return to campuses, numerous programs have reported positive tests for COVID-19, despite all of the precautions and practice restrictions in place. With that in mind, starting quarterback Kellen Mond was asked whether he felt safe enough during on campus during the pandemic. I think the you know NCAA, SEC, and um, you know everybody who's making these limitations and you know regulations are going to do a really good job and making sure that you know we're able to do you know try to reach as much as we can but also um, you know stay as safe as possible so um, you know I feel like you know that's why some of the stuff hasn't been approved on you know when we'll actually be back but um, you know now with voluntary workouts I feel like um, you know we can you know kind of stay take one step at a time and then you know we'll continue to move forward shortly. Texas A&M Athletic Director Ross Bjork has recently revealed that the number of positive COVID-19 tests among student athletes on campus have increased. He has not given an exact number of positive cases yet. This offseason has been filled with challenges for UTSA football with new head coach Jeff Trailer leading the way. The Roadrunners have seen their time together on the practice field cut short by COVID-19 and in the wake of the senseless tragedy of George Floyd's death in Minneapolis, the players and coaching staff were forced to grapple with the visible presence of racism in American society. The team has been adamant that they are closer than ever because of this adversity. But how have they navigated all of these challenges? You got to have mental toughness to get up every day and go work out on your own for three months straight without but I was seeing your coaches. I mean, it's tough. But when you when you actually base those five things, you bring them into your life. You make that your lifestyle. It's easy. Coach Trailer always says, you know, what you gonna do when it always when it don't go your way. You know, what you gonna do, you know, when when the chips don't fall your way. So that's what helped me a lot. The Roadrunners have vowed to use their platform to fight racial injustice throughout the upcoming season. A couple of NFL pros have been in San Antonio putting on a youth football clinic this week. Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receiver Steel Grayson and former Green Bay Packers safety Mike Tyson. San Antonio is the pilot city for the program. Fifth quarter, which is named for the extra effort you need to put in to succeed in football, school, and beyond. The duo hopes to grow the program and work with camps and young programs throughout the country. A handful of Brandeis sophomores came out for the inaugural event, and Grayson spoke about what the three-day clinic included. This program includes mentorship, just relational talking, we're going to talk to them, we're going to stay in contact with these guys, and we're going to teach them ball, but it's, like we said, ball builds character um, for everybody, and it's so much to life beyond football. We want to teach them things that's going to get them beyond that. An interesting fact about Gracie, he didn't play college football, but was a member of the LSU track and field team. For the first time ever, the Triple Crown race begins at Belmont Park in New York. It's the 152nd running of the Belmont Stakes. Tis the Law was the favorite coming in, and he lives up to the billing. As the pack rounds the final turn, Tis the Law turns on the Jets, and he ends up winning by four lengths. This is the first New York bred horse to win at Belmont in 138 years. Congratulations to him. And we end on a positive note here. The Spurs Coyote is at it again, posting this picture on social media wearing a mask. His request, be a mascot like him. And, of course, this also answers the question, how does the coyote put a mask on? He puts it around his cheeks, not his ears. <laughs> so, and now we know. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. You got it. Stay with us. All right, summer began today, and it is going to feel like it tomorrow to celebrate Dad. A high temperature around 96. Low in chances of rain the next few days. That will start to pick up a bit as we get into the middle and back half of next week. And don't forget that Saharan dust begins to roll in on Tuesday. We'll keep you updated on all things Saharan dust in our upcoming newscast. You can also find a lot of information online. Guys. Thank you, Katie. That's all of our time for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. That's right. Be sure to catch us on Good Morning San Antonio tomorrow morning starting at 6. Have a good night and happy early Father's Day.